I'm Paul Hollywood. And yes, I like my food. And that's lucky, because food is why Paul has come to Japan for the first time in his life. Oh. <laughs> he wants to expose himself to all this country has to offer, although thankfully that's not his bottom. <laughs> Paul's time here is about flexing his culinary muscles. That's an oyster, not a muscle. Paul is in Japan to eat. I've never been to Japan before. I mean, why would I? I'm a baker. It's all about rice and noodles, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, I'm told it's now the number one destination for food lovers. And that's why I'm here. I'm on a bit of a mission to learn why this country is so obsessed with food. Oh, mental! To see if the food here is as good as everyone tells me. We like the junk food! <laughs> and learn why eating plays such a crucial role in all aspects of Japanese life. 350 English pound for that strawberry. Just think about that for a minute. And, you know, in a land of rice and noodles, Baker Paul may even discover the odd bap or two. Bread is amazing. I'm loving it in heaven. Welcome to Japan! I'm starting my journey in the biggest city on Earth, Tokyo. Ooh, snazzy graphics. Greater Tokyo has over 38 million mouths to feed, and eating out is a way of life for the Edoko. That's what you call people who live in Tokyo, because this was originally a small fishing village called Edo. These days, Tokyo is paradise for food lovers. It has more Michelin stars than any other city in the world, and the Edoko have over 160,000 restaurants to choose from. Of course, when you find yourself in the middle of the world's biggest mega city, you could easily get lost. So for his first day here, Paul's got a guide, a comedian called Kilala, who knows and loves this city. Is that Godzilla? Godzilla, yeah! <laughs> the most famous Japanese actor! They'll be hanging out in Shinjuku. Crammed full of bars and restaurants, it's one of Tokyo's coolest neighborhoods. It's also home to half of the world's busiest railway station. I'm gonna be here for a while. I need to learn some of the day-to-day -day rules. So when you meet new people, just a bow. Oh, just a bow? Yes. Konnichiwa. Okay. Konnichiwa. Ah, yes. right, OK. What's goodbye? Well, goodbye. Sayonara. 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 Or you can say bye-bye. OK, bye-bye. <laughs> Paul has three weeks of intensive eating ahead of him. So what's called for is a crash course in Japanese restaurant etiquette and how eating out here differs from what Paul's used to back in Britain. British restaurant etiquette. Uh, learn to use your knife and fork, spend half an hour looking at the menu, then order what you always have. Don't dribble, don't throw food, pay the bill and leave a big tip. For Paul's first lesson in eating out Japanese style, Kilara takes him to a traditional tempura restaurant. Tempura Tsunahachi. Ooh, lunch time! <laughs> <laughs> I'm so hungry! They've been tempura specialists here for nearly a hundred years. The chef is Mr. Kuwata or Kuwata-san. So, yep. tempura. Yes, tempura. I mean, tempura. this is one of my favorite things, actually. Mm -hmm. So, what's he got on the menu, then? What's he got to offer? I'd like to ask him his omakase. Omakase? Omakase is uh, uh, he's going to serve what he thinks best today. Ah, so we don't pick it up to the chef? Yes, uh, because he is a specialist. He oh, knows yeah, best, of course. right? Uh, hey. 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 So, you avoid the embarrassment of asking for the English menu, and omakase shows great respect to the chef, meaning you get the pick of the day's freshest ingredients. And when I say fresh... Let's move on to his batter, shall we? He's not measuring it, is he? He's just putting it in by eye. He knows what it should be like. Throwing a little bit of the batter in the fat to see how it's going to react. Here in Japan, we focus on one thing and master it, and we call the person shokunin. 
So he is the shokunin of tempura. Is that all he does? Tempura. That's his only job. He's been focused on tempura for 22 years. Wow. So he's a specialist. Yes, the so best specialist. When I do my trade, I'm a baker, but that's pretty generic. Mm -hmm. I, I cover a lot of things. Mm -hmm. But these guys don't. They concentrate on one particular thing mm -hmm. and master it. Yes. Best. So first course, tempura prawn. Starting with the head. Should we start? Yeah, let's eat. But before that, wipe your hand okay. with this. Yeah. Okay. And some middle-aged guy always wipe their face too, but please don't do that. Middle-aged guy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're young, so... Yeah, uh. yeah, I won't do that. <laughs> All right, can you okay. just pick it up? Let's use chopstick. <laughs> it's got a tail, it's already got a handle. I'm not brilliant with these, but OK. But before that, let's show our gratitude against the food. OK. Itadakimasu. Like, thank you for food. Yeah. Itadakimasu. OK, itadakimasu. Right, itadakimasu. OK. <laughs> okay. Right, that's good. Yep, itadakimasu. Oh, wow. Oishi. That's stunning. Say oishi. Oishi. It's so light. Melts in the mouth. Wow. If that's the start, I'll tell you what, I can't wait for the rest. Now, you may think tempura is Japanese, but this style of cooking was originally brought here in the 16th century by Portuguese traders. As with many ideas from the West, though, the Japanese have made it their own and turned it into a culinary art form. I mean, just look at that fish. Did he do that deliberately, or is that just the way it happens? She yeah. made it on purpose. Wow, that's amazing. Yes. Do you like that? Yes. I really love fish. Oh, this wakasagi has babies and eggs. Lovely. It's very, yeah. Lovely. So, he's doing a load more now. Please stop pointing with chopsticks. Why? It's rude. <laughs> OK. Just to put your chopsticks... Ah, uh, back on the block. Yes. Chopstick etiquette is very important in Japan. You don't point, you don't leave them in or on your bowl, you don't stand them up in food, and you definitely don't stab food with the... Oh. No! It's childish. <laughs> like us five-year-old kid. Yeah, but five-year-old kids in like Japan that? are experts, aren't they? This yeah. is really... I'm really hungry. Yes. I reckon I can probably Please lose loads of weight in it. Japan. Because I couldn't get enough food into my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I could have this every day. Arigato, chef. Oh, shit. Thank Very you. Oishi. That was fantastic. Absolutely beautiful. Final course, anago, or sea eel. And first up, Paul gets to enjoy the eel spine, deep fried and tied in a knot. I was a little dubious about eating spine, but wow. It's like Paul crackling. That's bizarre. Great, though. It was like a Michelin-starred pork scratching. And the eel meat was even better. Wow, it was beautiful. How's Japanese fish? Mm. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. I did think that my local chippy back home was unbeatable, but that fried yeah. fish was the best fish I've ever had. Really, really good. Really good. Really good. Eely good. Oh. <laughs> Is it British joke? <laughs> kind of. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Oh, yeah. I'm a happy man. Mm. Thank you for bringing me here. Yeah. This is spectacular. If it gets any better than this, mm -hmm. I think I'll move to Japan. <laughs> oh, yeah? So, a quite fabulous start to Paul's food tour of Tokyo. And next up, a bit of myth busting. Apparently, Japan does do bread. I heard you're a baker, so yeah. I brought Japanese most popular bakes today. Really? Bread, yeah. Is it popular over here? Yeah, very popular. I fancy a loaf. This one? It's very fresh bread. In a can? Pan can. It tastes good. Well, I'll be okay. the judge of that. Wait, wait, wait. Don't eat on the street. Let's move to... Around the corner. So my quieter. Yes. So people can't see yeah. you. I mean, to be honest, I'd rather people didn't see me <laughs> eat this. So there's another little etiquette slap for me. 
Uh, apparently, you can't have food while you're on the street, while you're in the metro, while you're driving. It's not a law, it's just seen as impolite to eat in public. If you want a snack on the move, you find a quiet corner. Like this one. So, let's eat around here. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Nobody sees. I've got the orange one here. Orange, and I take strawberry. Oh, it smells sweet. Do not eat silicon to keep it fresh. Yeah. What the hell? How does it taste? It's a little bit chemically, you know, the flavours. Mm, I see. Artificial. It may not be the best bread Paul's ever tasted, but Kanpan did originally come to Japan after the massive Kobe earthquake in 1995. Oh, for emergency, for snack? I'm guessing flavour isn't the number one requirement for emergency rations. Yeah. Does it say anywhere here how long it'll last? Three years. Three yeah. years? Yes. Hmm? Is that the only bread you do in Japan? No, we have more. Because if that's the only bread in Japan, I'm in serious trouble. So Paul's first experience of Japanese bread certainly isn't winning any handshakes. But next up, one of Paul's favourites, fast food. Love a burger. Favourite meal, cheeseburger, fries and chocolate milkshake, or just a big bucket of fried chicken. Tokyo has more Michelin stars than any other city on the planet. Uh huh. At the same time, I've seen a lot of the Western franchises, oh, such as yes, McDonald's. Yes, Wendy's, Burger King, also, you know, KFC. Is that popular? Yeah, very popular, especially for Christmas. Yep, she's right, and this is brilliant. In 1974, KFC Japan promoted their fried chicken as the perfect Christmas meal. And the Japanese swallowed the idea hook, line, and chicken dipper. A lot of Japanese people think, oh, Western people eat KFC on Christmas Day. What? <laughs> Christmas uh -huh. in Britain, you have turkey traditionally or goose. Yeah. But certainly not a KFC. Oh my God, it's a little embarrassing. <laughs> Do you think I need to reveal it to other Japanese people? I, I, do it's you know what? Very, I think that point sales. Interestingly, the big Western chains which dominate fast food worldwide don't have it all their own way in Japan. This advert is for Moss Burger, a homegrown Japanese chain that's right up there with Colonel Sanders and Ronald. Moss Burgers are big in Tokyo, and their popularity is spreading right across Southeast Asia. And one of their most popular offerings puts a very Japanese twist on the conventional burger. I mean, they've replaced the bread with rice mm -hmm. to make it Japanese. Yeah, like a translation. It smells like sushi. Oh, yeah? It's a beef! <laughs> I'm dying to see what this tastes like. Should be a little soy sauce tasted, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't drop any trashes, please. I'm not. <laughs> it does work as a flavor. It really does. Mm -hmm. It tastes great. The quality is all mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. But it's not very practical as a on the move yeah. food. The tempura we had at lunchtime, that was a Portuguese import. But you've done it again. You've got that classic Western food mm -hmm. and turned it into something that's Japanese. I'm seeing a theme now in Japan. Mm. Wow. Just a great burger. Wow. Uh, well, I've had a fantastic day today. Mm -hmm. um, arigato. Thank you. Do I, I'll, do a West, I'll do a Western one as well. OK. Thank you very much indeed. Sweet. Thank Enjoy you. Enjoy burger. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. I really want the street. That's Paul Hollywood off the Bake Off. He's in Tokyo on the first leg of a delicious Japanese food tour. His aim? To discover why this is the most food-obsessed nation on Earth. Oh, this wakasagi has babies and eggs in his Lovely. belly. Yeah. Lovely. On Paul's second day in Tokyo, he's heading upmarket. His mission today is to find the very, very best high-end posh nosh that this city has to offer. Tokyo is the richest city on Earth, and there are a lot of people here with a lot of money to spend. And when it comes to buying food gifts, the Japanese are prepared to spend a fair bit more than us Brits. 
food gifts in the UK? Well, it's a bottle of something nice and a box of chockies, isn't it? I'll sometimes bake a cake. Paul's in Ginza district. It's like the Knightsbridge of Tokyo, packed full of upmarket shops and even more upmarket shoppers. At its heart is Japan's answer to Harrods, Isetan. Isetan's food hall is where Tokyo's richest residents come to buy food gifts, and they're not here to grab a bargain. I've just been doing some maths, and this little box here, which contains five dried prawns with one, two, three, four, five, six prawn crackers. Guess how much that cost? 75 quid. Wow, 75 quid. Matsuzuka, beef, loin. Now, let me work this out quickly. You're looking at 75 pounds for 100 grams. Now, you normally get an eight ounce steak, don't you? So you'd be paying You've got to be joking. You'd be paying nearly 200 quid per steak. Wow. Gift giving is a very important part of Japanese culture, and the quality of what you give reflects the respect you have for someone. The food gift business in Japan is worth a staggering 30 billion pounds each year. You're thinking, I'm going to go to someone's house. Bit of a celebration, family get together, you think, I'm gonna go and buy him a couple of melons. Oh yeah, 230 quid. I mean, they're beautiful and all that, but 230 quid. Fruit is where the really big money's at in gift giving. For up to 600 quid, you can get a piece of fruit grown in a mold, so it has an interesting shape. You want perfect mangoes? Then you're talking up to 3,600 pounds each. And the current record is a pair of Yubari melons which sold at auction for £35,000. Of course, if you enjoy paying a lot for your food, then a Michelin star or three is normally a good indicator of a high price tag in a restaurant. And as I think I mentioned earlier, Tokyo is home to 230 Michelin starred restaurants. That's more than London, Paris, Berlin and Barcelona put together and more than any other city on Earth. What's even more interesting is that Tokyo can be one of the cheapest places in the world to eat Michelin-starred food, unlike our own fair capital. A Michelin star is a guarantee of high quality, but it also tends to be a guarantee that you need to check your overdraft limits before booking a table. At my favorite Michelin-starred restaurants, you're staring down the barrel of 400 quid per person for a taster menu. I don't go there that often. While Tokyo does do expensive, this ordinary-looking ramen shop is one of the world's cheapest Michelin-starred restaurants. It's only got 12 seats, meaning when it's open, there's not even room to swing a noodle. So Paul has popped in out of hours. Nakiryu's owner is Chef Saito. Bit of a Japanese Heston, isn't he? A bowl of his ramen noodles starts at just 850 yen. That's a Michelin-starred meal for under seven quid. It smells amazing. It smells oh, delicious. One. Yeah, fantastic. For the British person that's watching this at home, what is ramen? Ramen. Mm. Ramen. <laughs> Don't worry, I can help here. Ramen is noodles in a tasty broth, usually with some meat, seafood or tofu plopped on top. Think of it like a, a posh pot noodle. The key element, according to Chef Saito, is the broth, or dashi, which he spends 10 hours making fresh every single day. So what's gone into this dashi? And how long has this been boiling for now? Today, the last ingredients to go in are dried fish, wet fish and a lot of seaweed. What happens at the end when you've finished to everything in there? そうですね。あの、丁寧にあの、こしあみでこしていきます。こ、ここに入ってる材料は全て捨ててしまいます。もう出汁として、あの、もう出し切ってあるので味もしないし。
So all that he'll use from this massive pot is the liquid. Every chef in the world wants a Michelin star. How did it make you feel? It smells amazing. And for me to be here talking to a Michelin star chef, I can't wait to try your ramen. <laughs> Ooh, nice noodle action. And so to the tasting. Paul is trying Chef Saito's celebrated spicy ramen with pork. Wow. And how good is it, Paul? Oh, my God. Thank you. It is absolutely stunning. You've got so many things going on in your mouth. Think of uh, the best chicken soup you've ever had in your life. This is that on steroids. And these noodles look so delicate. Am I meant to slurp this? Yes. I'm useless with chopsticks with noodles. I'm going to make a real idiot out of myself. It's the slurping means something because the slurping adds a little bit of air. The addition of the air brings out all the flavours. It's an absolute delight to eat one of these. Chef Saito's ramen is so popular that diners are refused a second helping so he can get more customers through the door. And he's even helped design what must be the poshest pot noodle ever. Wow, look at that. Pot noodle from Japan with the Michelin on it as well. That'd be interesting to try, but I'm not the one to try that. The sound man here is a bit of a, an aficionado when it comes to pot noodles. Ben, come over here. Come on, sit down. Now, because we didn't want Chef Saito to be the only one not slurping on a ramen today, Paul's brought along a little treat for him, too. This is the British most popular pot noodle. So Ben could try yours, and if you wouldn't mind, would you try this one? So now we can have an international pot noodle taste challenge. I think he's in for a real treat here, but yeah, I, do as well, yeah. I, I think he's going to really love it. You might have to re-evaluate his whole life. <laughs> I think he probably will, to be brutally honest. <laughs> Have you ever seen a pot noodle put in with a ladle before? No. I don't think <laughs> pot noodles have ever been touched by a Michelin star chef before. What does this smell? He loves it. He can tell. Good. Is it? That's good. Is it better than the. Uh... I'm never eating one of them again. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think Japan won that one. Can I have ten, please? <laughs> Arigato. Thank you. Thank you. All right, come on, Ben. Finish up. We're going to oh, go. I'll take it with me. <laughs> it's no wonder that Chef Saito has dipped his toe into a pot noodle. Every year, the Japanese eat four billion cup noodles, as they're known in Japan. And they're obsessed with them. Annually, millions flock to cup noodle museums. There are four of them across the country, and the newest is just south of Tokyo in Yokohama City. And this whole building, which is substantial, very modern, very cool, is dedicated to pot noodles. And it's rammed, absolutely rammed. Who knew? Look what I've missed all these years. There's even a replica here of the chicken shed in which Japanese national hero Momofuku Ando invented the cup noodle as a way to alleviate post-war food shortages. That's him again in this collage, alongside probably the world's greatest ever female scientist and the man who came up with an equation to explain the universe. They really do rate cup noodles here. There's over 3,000 cup or pot noodles in here. Crazy, isn't it? At 95, Momofuku's last gift to the universe was the invention of a cup noodle that can be made in space. Great day out, you know, for the kids. Paul loves his bread, and his big worry before arriving in Japan was that this country is breadless. 
In the UK, bread is everywhere. It's part of our lives. When something's really good, we say, it's the best thing since sliced bread. In the Lord's Prayer, we don't say our daily rice or daily noodles. We say, give us our daily bread. And we sing, bread of heaven. That could go on. You know, after a life of baking, Paul's got a good nose for sniffing out a flowery bap. I noticed when I've been going around Tokyo, actually, that they do have bakeries. And I saw queues going around the block on some occasion early in the morning waiting for these bakeries to open. Then I discovered that the oldest bakery in Tokyo is actually just around the corner from the hotel. Paul's hotel and the bakery are in Ginza district, the posh part where Paul saw those expensive melons. All the shops are upmarket here, including Tokyo's oldest bakery, Kumuraya, opened in 1869. It's taken me aback a little bit, to be honest, because I thought this was predominantly a rice-based culture, but I never expected to see that in Japan. And so we observe the Hollywood in his natural habitat. The quality here looks amazing. It's precision. It's the crumb structure. It's the look of it. I mean, I'm really genuinely <laughs> shocked. And there's some stuff in here I really want to try, actually, because I've never seen them before. This one in particular. Could I try this one, please? Hmm, we may be in here for a while. Now, this is melon bread with cream. Now, I've never seen anything like this. But what I'm curious to see is melon really has no inherent flavor. It'll be lost in a bread. It smells of melon. I am actually getting melon. It's like um, a gloopy, blitzed up melon inside a bread that's light, it's fluffy, it's crispy, it's very sweet. A lot of the bread I saw, actually, was very familiar to me, but it did have a slight twist. Now, if you look at that there, it's a Danish pastry with cheese inside it. Actually, I prefer that over the custard. That's crazy. Can I try a scone? Plain scones. Bet they fly off the shelf. Now, the secret is, with a good scone, is the shine on the top, nice and straight at the sides, and a decent amount of raisins in there. I'm in Tokyo. I'm eating something that comes straight from the Queen's afternoon tea menu. I mean, that is staggering. Natural split down the middle. It smells like a scone. I didn't expect this. It's a fantastic scone. And next up, the Star Bake, a wholly homegrown Japanese obsession. It's called Anpan. An, it's like a sort of red paste thing, but pan, pan is bread, it's like it is in France. They make and sell up to 10,000 anpans each day in this shop alone. And when Paul asked nicely, they agreed to show him the bakery. Yeah, that fits. <laughs> the dough for anpan takes 60 hours to make. Now that's a slow rise. Then each morning they do the rest in here, kneading, rolling, filling them with red bean paste and baking thousands of them. The flour is wheat flour. Bread flour. Bread flour. Ah, OK. Shioto, sato. Yeah. Egg. Egg. And butter. So it is basically an enriched dough. And the bean paste is going in the middle. Right. It's a bit like a brioche. And then you egg wash the top. Ah, nurimasu. Yeah. And then in the oven. Right. How long in the oven? Eight minutes. Eight minutes. The Japanese eat around five million anpan every day, and it was in this very shop that anpan was invented by a retired samurai, Yasube Kimura, in 1874. <laughs> and so to the tasting bit. He's good at this. About 20 years ago, I was in this academy of bakers, and we got offered jobs all over the world, and jobs were being offered for me in Japan. And I was thinking, they don't make bread. How wrong was I? I could have been living here now. <laughs> Making amber. <laughs> this is going to be interesting. Oh, 
I'm trying to identify the flavors. This is the red bean paste. It's got the texture, a little bit of a kidney bean. Remember fig biscuits when you were a kid? And you got that chew. That's what it's like inside there. A hint of cinnamon in there as well. The bread is brioche-like, but it's also like the softest flowery bap that you've ever had in your life. They're really tasty. They're quite Moorish, actually. To be honest, I was gobsmacked. I mean, we've been making bread in the West now for four or 5,000 years, and I think we're pretty good at it. However, the Japanese have only been making it for 150 years or so, and they've mastered it already. The stuff in that shop was absolutely top draw. I'm impressed. Whatever they touch, they make the best of. So, after placing a big, happy tick next to baking on his Japanese bucket list, Paul heads off for dinner in Shibuya. This bit of Tokyo is most famous for the world's busiest pedestrian crossing, where up to 2,500 people cross every time the little man goes green. It's also home to the other half of the world's busiest railway station. Paul, though, will be all alone tonight at Ichiran Ramen, part of a restaurant chain where you eat in solo dining booths, massively popular in Japan. What you doing? But a very alien concept for a sociable Brit like Paul. Eating out in Britain is all about being with people. It's a shared experience with family and friends, chatting, gossiping, and laughing about Brexit, religion, or Love Island. The thing is, Japan has a population crisis. There are a lot of old people, a drastically dropping birth rate, and over 15 million Japanese live alone. Dashy richness, garlic. In a city where the work ethic leaves little time to socialize, fewer and fewer young people are finding it possible to easily make friends or find partners. Go with medium. And so a whole ecosystem has grown up to cater for them. This chain alone has over 70 solo dining restaurants right across Japan. This solo dining place where you're in a telephone booth. Chassu. Oh, yeah, poor glass of that. All you see initially is just crotch after crotch. You can't see anybody unless you sort of give it who's next door. The sauce might be too spicy for children. Oh, jeez. I'm going mild. It's very strange. I got it. Oh, uh, certainly when they drop the bamboo down. Because the blinds are my own. You sort of going. It's weird. Mm, it smells nice. And I understand why they do it. The idea, I think, was built on the fact that women wouldn't want to be stared at eating on their own. The <laughs> fork, anyway. They could go into a private booth, enjoy the food on their own without getting stared at, and then wander off and do their own thing. <laughs> Nice water. <coughs> it's meant to enhance the flavour of the food by purely concentrating on what you're eating. As a Brit, I was more curious about who's coming in, what's that noise? Oh, there's another crotch. Rather than saying, that's nice food. <laughs> It's all these strange noises. It's just really bizarre. Eating, for me, is a sociable thing. So the thought of being in a booth on your own, I'm not so sure. You know, at the end of the day, Japan generally has got a problem with its population. They're trying to get the average births per family from 1.4 up. Going to a separate solo dining area is probably not the best thing to do for the country. You probably need to meet people. <laughs> Like a perfectly baked sponge, Paul Hollywood has risen to the challenge of eating his way across Japan and has reached his final day in the massive mega city of Tokyo. Now, you may know that Paul likes his cars, so we arranged for him to spend his last day driving himself around Tokyo in a go-kart, dressed as a ninja turtle. I think I'm in some sort of weird dream. Paul's taking a karting tour of Tokyo. Can you imagine them letting you drive go-karts around the streets in London or Liverpool? I mean, the closest thing you've got is an open-top red bus. 
Safer, yeah? But no fun. These tours are hugely popular, and everyone who goes on one gets to dress up as their favourite cartoon character. <laughs> Paul's companion for the day, however, has come in his own clothes. He's a man called Ladybeard. Ladybeard is, as you can see, an excitable cross-dresser. He came to Japan six years ago to pursue his stunt and wrestling career, and he fitted right in. Crazy guy! So how come, in one of the most conformist and conservative societies on Earth, Ladybeard has become such a big star? Bless you. I love you! The Japanese are a very special bunch, you see. Yeah. Because despite being highly conservative, they have a, a desire for the non-conservative yeah. in a way that I feel no other country really does. You yeah. know? So the Japanese are a hard-working bunch and living in a society in which you're forced to work 12, 14 hours a day, they enjoy leisure with everything they've got. That means that when people bust out, it's on like Donkey Kong. There's no holding back. It's all about letting off steam. Yeah, that's exactly right, because there's a lot of steam to be let off. Yeah. And that need to extract maximum entertainment value from everything the Japanese do, of course, extends into eating out. Tokyo is home to a lot of quite extraordinary themed restaurants. And in Japan, themed has a slightly more full-on meaning than it does in Britain. Theme restaurants in the UK. Sort of American diners in a shiny caravan. Greek restaurants with plastic pillars and a man playing a bazooki. There did used to be a burger place on the A1 which looked like a spaceship. Does that count? Oh, yes. When the Japanese do themes, they do themes. The choice includes sumo, samurai, Alice in Wonderland, moomins, ninjas, sexy topless men, prison, vampires, ghosts, toilets and even Jesus. There are hundreds of full-on themed restaurants in this city. We're heading now to one of these themed restaurants. That's right, mate. That's right. All right, Paul, well, let's just pull over here, mate. And at their first stop, they'll have to catch their lunch. Yeah. <laughs> you crazy guy, you crazy guys. <laughs> at Zauo, the fishing restaurant. You might have noticed we're sitting on a vessel. Yeah. This is quite the concept. You catch your own fish. Right. Pull it out, and then the very fish that you caught will be taken off to be cooked for you to consume. You have wow. a little uh, little thing of bait right here. All right, here we go. This is weird, isn't it? <laughs> here, fish, 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 fish. Oh! 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 oh, 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 oh. It was a big one as well. It was a huge one. One rule here, you can't throw fish back and try for a bigger one. You catch it, you eat it. Hygiene and all that. Yes, mate. Yes, mate. Good, good. I've got you. I've got you, my no. friend. Come here. Oh! Oh, he's a big fatty! Oh, mate! Hey! Hey! Ladybeard's netted a madai, or red sea bream. Hello, madam. Thank you very much. Yo, up! Look at that, Paul Hollywood. Yes! It's amazing! A few minutes later, that fish that we caught turned up on a plate as sashimi. Holy moly, that's, that's fantastic. That's a lot of fish. Look at the presentation on this. All right. Let's give it a go. Give it a go. Itadakimasu. It's not bad. Yeah. It's fresh. It's fresh. I mean, I find that a delicacy. And the fact that you have to fish for it, it's a great idea. It's great fun. Of course, after a massive plate of raw fish, the best digestif <laughs> is a bit more urban carting. I feel like you're gonna drop a banana peel or something. <laughs> I should add, this has absolutely nothing to do with that very famous game, Mario Kart. No relation to Nintendo! None! <laughs> Next stop for our costume crusaders, Rio, a puppy cafe. And dog lover Paul is clearly in heaven. Although Ladybeard seems less happy. What's the gig? What are we doing? Hey, Paul, how are you? <laughs> Let's go look at this. You look like 
you're in the kingdom of doom. Hello, how are I you? Lo I love dogs anyway in puppies. You're slightly nervous right. around them, aren't you? I, um, uh, yes, I have an irrational fear. Oh, oh, God, this one's... Oh, God. Hello, how are you? <laughs> Good to see you. Oh, mate. Hang on, I'm going to um, give you a little bit of the time. Let your beard will stay over here and observe. Bit, easy. This process. Animal cafes have now spread right around the world, but it was here in Tokyo that they first took off properly. And if, like Ladybeard, you're scared of puppies, you can find cafes filled with micro pigs, penguins, or owls. I'm not sure how you would really have this experience with an owl. All the dogs are actually therapy dogs and they're used in hospitals and care homes, although I don't think Ladybeard was finding it at all therapeutic. You've done really well, mate, considering Thank you. you don't like puppies. So we didn't even order a cup of tea, we just left. How do I prevent the dogs from leaving? Oh, God, this one's trying to kill me. I'm just going to go over the top like this. Oh, jeez, what a view. <laughs> you didn't pay for that, Paul Hollywood. Paul Hollywood didn't pay for that. Oh. For their final stop of the day... You're crazy, guys! Ladybeard has promised to take Paul to whole new heights of pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, we will be taking off shortly. Oh, good. Please make oh, sure nice. that your seat belt is securely fastened. Thank you. Oh! Oh, 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 oh my, my god! god. Oh, holy moly! <laughs> yes. Look out the window's going. Oh, I cannot get the window. Look at that! Oh, yeah! It's brilliant, isn't it? Oh, wow. The front comes up. Oh, oh yes. Ooh. <laughs> this is relaxing. <laughs> Could your seat work? Not, not a hunt. Oh, it does now! Oh, it does now! Oh, yes! Oh, this is... Oh, wow. <laughs> of course, you've probably guessed they haven't actually left the ground. In fact, they're on the upper floor of an office block, repurposed as the posh end of a jumbo jet. Excuse me, could you please sit back, please? This is nice. This is classy. It's a placemat. This is first class, though, isn't it? Thank you. If you're sitting here and you're on a date, for instance, yeah. and you have another eight people sitting in here as well, I mean, it's pretty strange, isn't it? If I were brought on a date mm -hmm. here, I would be very happy. What do you call this? Yeah, I've waited all night for you to say that. <laughs> Shall we move on to the main course? Oh, what's happening here? Duck steak. Dear me, duck steak? Duck steak. Oh, my God. Wow. This is the classiest first class I've ever experienced. Absolutely. Thank you, Thank madam. Thank you very much. Wow. It's been a fairly odd time. I thought, I'm in some sort of weird dream. I'm going to wake up in a minute. This is actually the real world, Paul Hollywood. I oh, know. Every meal in Japan is eaten in a themed restaurant. I think it's very clever. Mm. I've never experienced anything quite like this before. Oh. It's been a real pleasure, mate. You've really happy. introduced me to another Japanese culture, Fantastic. which I think has been fascinating. Well, I'm very glad that we could share such a wonderful experience together. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Cheers, buddy. Thank you. <laughs> and that's it. An extraordinary first week in Japan, and Paul hasn't even left Tokyo. I've learned a lot, and I haven't even left the voiceover booth.